Hi everybody, this is going to be a brief video to give you some tips for studying for the final exam. First, let's go over some basic final exam facts. As I mentioned already, about 20% of the exam will be based on Excel, and I've given you that information already in class. Then about 30% of the information will be based on new stuff, so that's chapter 7 where we covered correlations, and chapter 10 where we covered chi-square analyses. The rest of the exam, about half of it, will be comprehensive, meaning I'll ask you questions about other things that we've covered throughout the semester. So here are some tips. One of the first tips that I have is to print out the formula sheet, look it over very carefully, and make sure you understand it. You need to make sure that you understand the symbols and things like that so that you know how to use each of the formulas listed. This is essentially going to be your crutch throughout the exam you want to make sure you know how to use this tool very well. If you have questions about anything on the formula sheet, be sure you ask me. Let's first begin talking about the new stuff that will be covered on the final exam. So for example, in chapter 7 we talked about correlations. So when you're studying about correlations, be sure you understand some of the basic types of correlations in terms of positive, negative, and what does it look like if we have no correlation at all? What does that mean? Make sure you understand about the range of correlations and that they're standardized. They're always going to range between negative 1 and 1. A correlation of 0 represents no relationship at all. Of course, you're going to want to be able to calculate correlation coefficients. That's the value R that we're computing, a Pearson correlation coefficient. A coefficient is just a number. So in this particular case, we computed a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.95. So you'll be using these formulas. I'll give you some different data. And of course, you'll have to compute a Pearson correlation coefficient for me. At that point, of course, you're going to need to be able to compare it to a critical value. That table will be provided uh, on the final exam to you. And then you'll need to stick that information into our four-step hypothesis testing procedure to determine if we have statistically significant results. There are some other basic pieces of information that are important when we're dealing with correlations. One of the most important is understanding why correlation does not prove or imply causation. So essentially everything we just talked about with correlation applies to the chapter for chi-square and that's chapter 10. So again, we're talking about new information since exam two. When it comes to chi-square, now we're dealing with relationships between variables, but these are variables that are not quantitative in nature. These are categorical variables. You can see that each person here, here are 10 people just stuck in a category. They are non-smokers who have cancer. So there's nothing quantitative about it. This is non-quantitative data, often ca called categorical data. Well, when we have this type of data, we can analyze it to determine if there are relationships using a chi-square analysis. One thing we learned is that we have to look at our observed frequencies and compare them to expected frequencies. Those are the frequencies that we would expect to find if there was absolutely no relationship between the two variables that we're looking at. In this case, one variable is cancer. The other variable is smoking status. So cancer status, smoking status. We use this formula to compute the expected frequencies, and then we put that into our chi-square formula where we compared the expected frequencies to those observed frequencies, and then found a chi-square value. We then compared that chi-square value to a critical value. Here's a little table that shows the critical values to determine if we have statistically significant results. Of course, I'll provide that table for you. Um, I'll provide it to you on the final exam. So once we determine if we have statistically significant results, of course, we can force that into our four-step hypothesis testing procedure. So this four-step procedure is very powerful. We need to know how to use it, whether we're dealing with um, simple z-scores and means or proportions, whether we're dealing with correlations, or whether we're dealing with chi-square analyses with categorical data. The same four steps are always used. Now let's talk a little bit about the comprehensive nature of the final exam, looking back at things that we've been discussing all semester long. You might recall, even in that first chapter, there were a lot of new definitions that were listed, a lot of new concepts. So you'll want to make sure that you understand these basic definitions. Some students use note cards, some students just thumb through the, the textbook looking for bolded terms. But 
at any given point, we should be able to look at a definition and understand what that concept is about. If we can't do that, then it's very hard to answer questions about those concepts. We also want to make sure that we understand the basic types of data that we're dealing with. Already in this video, I've discussed quantitative data, non-quantitative data. It's important to understand what those things mean. So again, we can kind of follow the discussion and understand what analyses are most appropriate. Symbols are very important. Again, we want to be able to speak the same language. And if I'm speaking that language using symbols like mu or n, it's important that we all understand what those mean so that we can answer questions and compute calculations based on those symbols. Those symbols, of course, lead to important concepts. So sampling error is essentially discussing differences between population parameters and sample statistics. Well, in order to really understand that concept, we would need to understand the symbols that we use to represent those concepts, or at least important issues related to those concepts. Then, of course, these basic concepts lead to other basic concepts. So sampling error is used to compute margins of error. You know, we, we know that there are differences from one sample to the next. We can compute a margin of error and then a confidence interval to estimate a population parameter. So if all those terms are kind of confusing to you right now, it's important to look again at those basic concepts, those basic definitions, and see how they fit together. Because, of course, then we want to have a good sense of the big picture. All of those symbols, all of those concepts are put together to look at the big picture that we have. And in general, we're typically trying to find if we have statistically significant results. Well, what exactly does that mean? It's important that we understand what that means and how those different concepts contribute to the big picture. Let's talk about actually computing things now. That's a really straightforward part of the exam. We need to be able to create and interpret basic things like tables, graphs, charts, and plots. Here's just an example of a frequency distribution table, a frequency distribution graph. And from these graphical representations, we should be able to pull some data, like figure out the overall end or the, or the probability of scoring in some particular category. Here's just another example. Now I'm dealing with something like a stem and a leaf plot. Again, from that plot, we should be able to pull some data, compute something like a mean. If we know how to interpret this plot, we should be able to do that pretty easily. Of course, we described our data initially very simply using central tendency, one of the three measures of central tendency, like the mean, the median, and the mode. This particular table right here does a great job of discussing uh, the, the good points and the bad points of using the mean, the median, or the mode some of the advantages, disadvantages, definition of them, things like this. It's a very helpful table. Of course, we also want to be able to look at the distribution of our data and describe it and, and essentially understand what that graph means. We can do that one way in terms of the number of modes that a distribution has, whether it's unimodal, bimodal, or trimodal. And of course, this would be relatively rare. We often tend to see normally distributed data that would be unimodal. We also describe the shape of our distribution in terms of skewness or symmetry. That normal distribution that we focus so much on is um, symmetrical. However, we sometimes run into distributions that are skewed. So we should understand how to define those distributions, whether they're left or right skewed, and understand how it affects our data. We also talked about how we could describe our data in terms of its variability. So we use some measures that were very simple, like computing a range. Other measures were a little bit more complex, provided more information. So for example, we computed the five number summary and we use that information to create box plots. And here we were able to see that this box plot shows that the data has much less variability than the data represented over here with this box plot. So it's important to be able to understand the different parts of the box plot and how to create them and how the five number summary is used to put that all together. Of course, we also computed standard deviations. They are, are our default measurement of variability. So if I give you some data, you should be able to compute a basic standard deviation. 
All I can do is give you different numbers. The formulas remain the same. You should be completely prepared to do that. Of course, then we started talking about probability because we were turning that corner from basic inferential statistics and we wanted to be prepared to compute some inferential statistics. And inferential statistics is based on the language of probability. So we discussed some basics of probability, relative frequencies, theoretical probabilities, subjective probabilities. We computed relative frequencies. We computed theoretical probabilities. You should be able to do that. We used that information from probabilities to compute interesting things like expected values. We used information from probabilities to apply it to a normal distribution where we were then able to estimate ranges of values. We were then able to use that information to compute confidence intervals and estimate population means. We were also able to estimate population parameters using uh, confidence intervals. In this case, I'm talking about population proportions. Here were formulas for choosing uh, sample sizes when we were dealing with population means, trying to estimate those with some level of um, confidence. Here is the same type of thing, but now dealing with population proportions when we wanted to estimate those with some level of confidence. Of course, we learned how to do hypothesis testing using a four-step procedure. In that very first step, we were just stating some basic hypotheses whether they were one-tailed or directional hypotheses or two-tailed hypotheses. So we had right and left-tailed, one-tailed tests and two-tailed tests that we discussed. Be sure that you understand how to determine if we have statistically significant results when we're doing a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. And of course, all you need to do is look in your formula sheet and you will see these tables showing some critical values. Here we have critical values added to that table for two-tailed tests. And we have plenty of examples in our notes for two-tailed tests. This one in particular is regarding means. And we have plenty of examples also in our notes for one-tailed tests. This particular example is using proportions. So that's everything in a nutshell. As you're studying, if you have questions, be sure and you let me know. I wish you luck on the final exam. For now, that is all.